of new imperialism we're going to be looking at china and the first opium war there are two of them but the first one is the particularly important one so 1839 1842 so let's look into our contextualization first so first uh let's say europe i'm going to be pretty specific to the british here so britain has wants a ton of goods from china silk for clothes fashion we know that spices because who wants to eat unspiced meats Ugh. uh tea ridiculously important think about tea with the british um porcelain so where do you put your tea in well you need fine china aka porcelain and additionally think of the context of growing middle class growing consumerism having luxury items like fine porcelain shows off your wealth so here's the issue britain can't really trade for any of these because China doesn't really want anything Britain has to offer. They have historically viewed other parts of the world as inferior. Again, form of ethnocentrism. We covered it last year in Global One, in theory. And Britain needs to figure out a way to get, basically buy tea without losing a lot of money. Basically, Britain doesn't want an unfavorable balance of trade between itself and China. They want to make the most money possible. So their idea was, well, they should become one of the largest drug dealers in the world. So uh, at this point in time, the British East India Company controls good portion of India. And India is the largest producer of opium in the world. It comes from the red poppy, and it can be formulated into an extremely highly addictive drug, narcotic, that is still used in a lot of painkillers today. So Britain harvests the opium. British merchants then smuggle it to China. Well, actually, they send it to uh, little islands off the coast of China and then sell it to Chinese merchants. And they would get silver in exchange. So Britain's selling opium to Chinese merchants in exchange. Now the British are getting silver. And silver is the only thing China would like s sell tea for. Britain cannot use any of its own goods to trade for tea. They have to basically buy it. So Britain is essentially using the silver they're getting from the Chinese who are buying the opium and then are going to use that silver to buy the tea. So what Britain does is they literally want Chinese people to get addicted to the uh, opium first. So they first sell the opium at ridiculously low prices to the Chinese merchants who then smuggle it ashore, and they get a good portion of the population addicted to it. Then the British jack up the price, and they make an incredible amount of profit. So eventually, the Chinese government figures out what the British are doing, which is basically being the world's largest drug dealers, and they start finding these stores of opium on these islands, start burning it. Well, you start burning British uh, goods, that's going to cause significant problems, especially in this time period. So effectively what Britain just did is they reversed a trade deficit in their own favor. Like that is the definition of economic imperialism. So uh, China actually declares war on Britain first. This leads to a three year long war. And really what you just got to know is that Britain has superior naval technology, military technology. Um, Really, everything about the British military is pretty much top-notch at this time compared to most other parts of the world. So they defeat China. Uh, so the war is ended by this treaty that you gotta know. Circle it, star it, gotta know the Treaty of Nanjing. So uh, the Global Regents exam has like these lists of quote-unquote unequal treaties. Quite frankly, almost all treaties are unequal, but this one is particularly unequal. And there are some things, uh, characteristics that you should know about it. So again, Britain wins the Opium Wars. Uh, they're going to dictate the terms of the treaty and make it favorable to them. And this is all going to be connected to imperialism. So... First, uh, Britain is given like exclusive trading rights in China. So they're essentially said, all right, this swath of land only British merchants can trade in and they have effectively a monopoly over trade. There you go, economic imperialism. Uh, eventually, uh, they will call these spheres of influence. So like here's your British sphere of influence and then other European nations get involved. So here's your German sphere of influence, your Russian sphere of influence, and then the Japanese, once they become an imperial power as well by the turn of the century, they all gain a sphere of influence. But please note, I'm talking about 
like economic imperialism, colonization did not occur. That's key. Colonization did not occur in China until uh, the Japanese take over the East Coast uh, by the 1930s. All right. Additionally, with the uh, Treaty of Nanjing, this is where Britain officially gains Hong Kong, which they keep until 1997. So when you talk about imperialism, the repercussions are so long lasting. Uh, Next, uh, this one actually comes up quite a bit on the global regions. Brit uh, Britons gain the right of extraterritoriality. Say that, extraterritoriality. Basically means if a British citizen commits a crime in China, they will not be tried in China. They will be sent back to Britain, probably London, in a British court, then be tried for it. You can probably guess what the result of that will be. Yeah, they're probably going to be let off the hook. So effectively, Britons can follow British law while living in China. And that is a huge advantage. Again, that would be an example of really probably social and maybe a little bit of political imperialism. All right, again, uh, you can read through uh, the Opium's War here. All right, next case study is New Imperialism, this time in Central Africa, the region called the Congo. So this is going to be one of the more striking, frankly, one of the most depressing examples of uh, colonialism and imperialism that we can cover. So here's our context. Uh, so the king of the Belgians at this point, yes, they call him the king of the Belgians, not the king of Belgium, uh, because technically the civilian government in Belgium has a bit more power than the king did. His name was Leopold II. Please don't confuse him with Leopold I of the Austrian Empire, very different people. Leopold II, just pure evil in every single facet of the word. So the context first is Belgium's civilian government was not terribly interested in in colonization yet and this really annoyed leopold ii eventually belgium will be a, a colonial power as you saw on the previous slide but right now not so much uh leopold was also the main belgian representative at the berlin conference by the way so what he's basically going to do is he's going to colonize central africa like privately literally private colonialism so like the way I look at this is imagine you take any major corporation in the United States and think of the CEO of, I don't know, Jeff Bezos or Amazon, literally will colonize an area. Like that's essentially the equivalent here. Leopold II was enormously wealthy. So he acquires the Central Africa, which he eventually renames the Congo Free State Colony. Eventually we'll call it the Belgian Congo. And he does it by very problematic means. So he sends explorers, um, private mercenaries to Central Africa and effectively forces the tribal leaders in Central Africa to sign these documents that they can't even read. And they basically give up their land or, for, or sell it to Leopold for ridiculously low prices. And he just gained control of a good chunk of Central Africa and... Uh, in particular, one really w important natural resource, which, which will be rubber trees. So the way he's going to govern this colony is he used a private army, mercenaries, and it was called the Force Publique. And these were, uh, they were white Belgian officers uh, who, co who commanded predominantly uh, black Congolese soldiers who were fighting in the force publique. So they're basically, the force, the Congolese were being paid to work in for fight in this mercenary army. Uh, we're going to see a very similar setup with the British East India Company uh, and their Indian soldiers during colonization of India, and they were called the Sepoys. So very similar setup here, where uh, Europeans are actually using uh, native labor. So <clears throat> the... Resource you're looking for, as I mentioned, is rubber. So why is rubber so stinking important? Well, here we go. We already got tires. Bicycles are becoming hugely important. Automobiles eventually. Medical equipment. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit of modern medicine happening at this point, and we know rubber is really important. Uh, so Leopold is going to have essentially a monopoly over the world's rubber trade because the Congo region has the highest concentration of them in the entire world. So 
because this is colonialism, the whole idea is profit and efficiency. So this is how Leopold's going to ensure that he has the most profit as possible. So he's going to use his force publique to set up quotas. So the Congolese are effectively enslaved labor, and they're given quotas on how many rubber trees they have to harvest every single day. So I'm just going to take a random number. Say uh, they had to harvest, say, 100 rubber trees a day. Um, maybe the person wasn't feeling too good, they harvested 90 rubber trees or 95 rubber trees. And when they go to turn in their day's harvest, they count it, it's low, uh, they would have their arm cut off. They would have a foot cut off. Uh, in some cases, they would just be flat out killed right there on the spot. The whole idea was he was trying to instill terror to ensure efficiency. And the result of this is absolutely horrific in about the uh, two decades that this occurred. So the numbers are a bit tough to solidify, but we're looking on average approximately 10 million Congolese murdered by Leopold II. So he is up there uh, with the um, other horrific 20th century dictators of Stalin, Mao, uh, Hitler, you name it. So 10 million people killed in about two decades uh, using enslaved labor of the Congolese. So uh, initially, uh, not many people really knew what was going on in Congo, and eventually a few Western photographers actually smuggled themselves into the Congo and started taking photographs uh, of the people who were working on his rubber plantations. And uh, it's actually some of the best documentation that we have of the atrocities that Leopold II committed. And no, if you're curious, he was never really brought to justice. He died of old age. All right, uh, so... Next, I have two readings on uh, the on Leopold's Congo. I highly recommend that you read them. It will show you just how horrific uh, the treatment of these Congolese were. So we have one reading from a fantastic book, King Leopold's Ghost. Uh, it is super depressing to read, but it's just one of those books that you really should probably read at some point in your life. Um, and then we have one that talks that's a bit more it's a, a prime a bit more of a primary source. All right. Again, you can read through these on your own. You can pause it now, and we'll keep going. More explo exploitation of colonial people. So again, uh, this is going to actually talk about a series of lions who were killing uh, workers working on a railroad and how that was dealt with. Okay, uh, now we'll let's look at India. Again, another example that gets so many questions on the Global Regents exam. There has been an AP Euro DBQ about British colonialism in India. So this is a really important topic, even though it's not like specifically European history, it's world history, but obviously um, has a lot of importance for many, many reasons. So here we go with our, our context. So it's really since the 18th century, um, you know, think about the uh, Seven Years' War. Uh, part of that war was fought between the French and the British in India. So uh, Britain has had an interest in India since the 18th century. And the, the group that will really start colonizing India first is actually the British East India Company. Not exactly the British government. That's going to happen after the Sepoy Rebellion itself in 1857. Uh, uh, but... The British East India Company is going to be the main player first. So again, what's the resources that they're after? Cotton, tea, opium. Indigo is another one, which will be particularly important for eventually blue jeans. Uh, but cotton, tea, and opium are the main ones. We already know the relationship between opium eventually with the uh, opium wars. Tea, obviously. Cotton, ridiculously important. So <clears throat> the British East India Company uh, is going to establish their own private military, similar to what Leopold II did with the Sports Publique. So again, they had white officers, and uh, they would then hire Indian soldiers. And those Indian soldiers were called sepoys. So I would circle the term sepoys. And uh, the like, long-term cause of the Sepoy Rebellion is really just continued British occupation of India, this continued grabbing of land at the expense of um, 
the traditional Indian princes, uh, and the also the declining Mughal Empire. Remember one of those gunpowder empires you covered in Global One last year? So as the Mughals are declining, as those uh, independent Indian princes are losing power, uh, the British East Indian Company is effectively stepping in and taking over their land. They actually made a law that when an Indian prince died, the British East India Company automatically got the land. How that was legal, no idea. So uh, the spark, though, of this rebellion was the British East India Company uh, made a new rifle, it was a Lee Enfield rifle, still a, mu a muzzle loader, and it was given to the sepoys. And the way the bullets were lubricated was different. It was lubricated with pig or cow fat, and that is a huge problem. Because if you think of the population of Indians at this point, the two most common religions for Indians are Hindu and Muslim. About 30% of Indians at this point were Muslim, so a very significant minority. So what can't in Hindus eat? Any cow-related products, because cows are sacred in Hinduism. For Muslims, what aren't they allowed to eat? Any pig products, it's, um, it's against their religion. So when they're using these cartridges, their hands are touching this lubrication, and obviously that can get in your mouth, and that effectively means they're consuming something they're not allowed to eat. And that is the straw that breaks the camel's back. The sepoy soldiers revolt against their British officers, and this revolt eventually uh, encompasses a good portion of the subcontinent. Workers are g gathering, peasants are gathering, and this almost year-long rebellion uh, is going to result in many British settlements, Christian missionaries being murdered. Um, I have the statistics down here, but they're pretty substantial. So now you have British people being killed, the British are going to send in the troops. So they start destroying Indian villages, committing pretty horrific war crimes as well. Um, the Britain actually used a very uh, specific type of execution for captured sepoys. They'd actually strap them to the front of cannons and light the cannon. Um, again, really to instill fear that they sh cannot, should not revolt against the British. So the rebellion is crushed by the British East India Company. Again, about 800,000 Indians are killed between the rebellion itself, famine, disease, and about 6,000 Britons, including military, including civilians as well. And uh, what are the impact? Again, uh, the impact is key to know. So first, this is why Britain actually takes over India as a colony. So no longer is it British East India Company in control. This is actually the British government. So Britain renames India the British Raj. And Raj means rule in Hindi. Queen Victoria, yes, that Queen Victoria, is declared Empress of India. So the subsequent British monarchs will be called Emperor of India. Um, India uh, until uh, India gains its independence in 1947. So additionally, uh, the Seaport Rebellion, even though it technically failed, it did spark a significant rise in nationalism. And this really is a long-term process. So this gradual calling for Indian independence uh, is going to be taken up by a group called the Indian National Congress, which was a nationalist organization of Indians with a very simple goal of making India independent to British rule. Uh, there's eventually uh, a Muslim equivalent, and really that Muslim equivalent is going to eventually uh, break off and form another group that's going to eventually create the country of Pakistan, but that's going to be a discussion for another day. And this Indian National Congress will eventually be led by Mohandas K. Gandhi, who will ultimately be successful uh, in leading India to its independence after World War II. All right, so we've got a couple of readings here on the Sepoy Rebellion. Uh, this is a particularly uh, good primary source. It just talks about how horrific uh, the rebellion was, especially with the British response. All right, next is Japan. And Japan's going to be a bit different. Uh, we know China. Oh, sorry, we haven't gotten to China yet. That's going to happen after Japan. Uh, so Japan is going to be especially different than India. Japan will not be colonized by Europeans or Americans. It will be imperialized initially, uh, but will not be colonized. And that's an important differentiation. 
So our context, uh, last year in Global One, you should have talked about how Japan cut itself off uh, from trading with most Westerners. Uh, so when uh, Europeans were initially making contact with Japan, uh, they were having missionaries go on those boats and they start converting a good portion of the Japanese population to Christianity. Well, the government in charge were, was the Tokugawas, they had the Tokugawa shogunate, and they effectively cut off all Westerners from Japan. One exception was, like, the Dutch could trade in one harbor uh, in Japan, and that was it. Because uh, largely the Dutch didn't care about religious conversion, they just cared about making money. So, the Tokugawas uh, cut off Japan, and Japan is largely uncontacted by Europeans uh, for over 250 years. Then... The United States president at the time, Millard Fillmore, who, by the way, from Moravia, New York, so if you're one of my Ithaca students, it's only like 45 minutes away, that's where my president is from, he instructs one of his admirals in the U.S. Navy, and uh, one of the ranks as an admiral in the U.S. Navy is called Commodore, it's like a one-star admiral, uh, sends, he gives him a note, and the note basically reads, Japan, trade with us or else, yes, I'm paraphrasing it, but it is actually a fairly short document. And Commodore Perry is leading a fleet of top-of-the-line naval ships with really big guns. So they dock in, effectively, Tokyo Harbor, called Edo at the point, at that time. And, the, and Commodore Perry delivers this letter to the emperor, to the, Tokuga, to the uh, shogun as well. And it effectively is going to force Japan to open up to Westerners to trade. Uh, some people call that gunboat diplomacy. So the term to know here is called the Meiji Restoration. First, Meiji is going to be the name of the young emperor. And here he is right here, as you can tell, fairly young. Amazing hat, by the way. And he's going to lead this modernization westernization process so we talk about this term modernization westernization we talked about it with peter the great catherine the great continuing on that process japan is going to do something similar where they're going to use what they consider to be beneficial from westerners use it for themselves and then basically gain a very powerful country that can eventually colonize as well so again the terms are modernization westernization uh, with japan and this is what really prevents Japan from being colonized. Um, and that is key. They're going to create a modern military that will defeat Western powers, a.k.a. Russia. Uh, so we're going to see a little more specificity in the next slide here. Um, some of the uh, reforms or changes in the Meiji Restoration. So let's look at examples of this modernization, Westernization process. First... The Meiji Emperor literally abolished the entire class of samurai. So for over a millennia, the samurai have led Japanese have been the Japanese military. And in place, they put a conscript army, a drafty army that was largely made up of peasants. The Japanese have historically never armed peasants. It just did not work in their feudal system. And they're being trained with these new Western weapons. By Western weapons, I mean firearms. The samurai did not use firearms. They used their swords, they used bows and arrows. So here they're using Western weapons. They're being trained by American uh, army officers. They're being trained by British officers. They actually would hire American officers, send them to Japan to then train the military, and they would pay them an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, and then eventually, you know, they're going to have a Hollywood film based on this called The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise starring. Fascinating film. Recommend watching it. Problematic, but still recommend watching it. So <clears throat> then uh, other things that are going to be modernized and westernized with Japan, they're going to create a modern nail <laughs> nailway, railway network, one of the most uh, ext um, complex in Asia. It India definitely had the most complex railway network uh, in Asia, but at least in East Asia, Japan will uh, very quickly have a modern system. So additionally, the whole idea of Meiji Restoration is to centralize Japan as well. And historically, like many parts of the world, countries have not been centralized. Here, they're going to try and do that actually have a national language, try and like remove these regional dialects. And all of that allows a country to more effectively govern itself, especially if they're going to become a colonial power. So pretty quickly, Japan is going from a feudal society without modern technology 
to a first-rate industrial and colonial power that will defeat Russia in a one-year war in 1905. So this is hugely important, and it really is a turning point in Japanese history uh, because they're going to engage in a significant colonization campaign um, by the 1930s. Okay, for another reading here. More reading, this one from The Economist. All right, Boxer Belly. Now we're looking at imperialism in China. And again, uh, we're going to see China is not going to be colonized by Westerners. It will eventually be colonized by the Japanese, as I said multiple times so far. Uh, but we are going to see significant economic uh, imperialism. So first, because of the Treaty in Nanjing, we know that China was divided into quote-unquote spheres of influence. Give it a circle. And this is going to set up China to be economically controlled by Westerners. Uh, before I go any further, I want to talk about this political cartoon here. Uh, it is pretty uh, well used by the Global Regents exam. So I'll read the caption. It says, a French political cartoon depicting China as a pie about to be carved up by Queen Victoria of Britain, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Marianne of France. Marianne is kind of like Uncle Sam for the French. And a Japanese samurai. Why a Chinese Mandarin uh, helplessly looks on. So you can kind of tell that the author of this cartoon was French, because look at how uh, the Marianne is portrayed. She almost looks heroic, almost like a, I don't know, maybe goddess is the wrong word. And then they saw them carving up the pieces of China, and we see these, uh, the figures kind of anim animated in a more critical sense. And then you have a very racist portrayal of this Chinese man here with these long fingernails. He doesn't even look human. So uh, this again showing that kind of the, the economic division of China, not necessarily political uh, colonization, but that economic division of China. So knowing we have these spheres of influence, uh, China's being controlled by Westerners economically, quite frankly, to an extent politically, there's now going to be a native reaction against this, a nationalist reaction. I would actually write the word nationalism right above the slide. It's probably written somewhere else, but that's the key, nationalism. So the, it'll be called the Boxer Rebellion by Westerners, uh, but this group, what Westerners will call boxers, they did have another name. They called themselves the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, which is a fantastic name, by the way. And these are young Chinese nationalists. They are trained in martial arts. Uh, they engage in what we call what, shadow boxing. So, like, what, Americans would, like, look at them like, oh, why are you guys just, like, you know, punching thin air? So they just kind of called them boxers, right? So uh, they're going to look at China's... Uh, it, control by Westerners and Japan as very problematic, especially for the fact that so many Chinese are being converted to Christianity. So they start assassinating Westerners and additionally Chinese subjects, especially those who converted to Christianity. So you start assassinating Westerners, that's going to elicit a response. So it is a fairly long rebellion, it's two years long. And uh, this rebellion was supported by the Empress of China at the time, Empress Dowager Zixi. Zixi. There we go, Zixi. <laughs> Apologies on pronunciation. <clears throat> so, what's the result going to be? Well, if you start assassinating foreigners, the response is going to be a really big group of more foreigners going to repress this. So, Western powers plus Japan, they make this eight-country coalition. Uh, they make like a brief alliance to crush this rebellion. They send in the navies, they send in the ground armies, and they re destroy this rebellion. So the results are key. So first and foremost, China does start executing members of the Boxer Rebellion, not surprisingly. China had to pay reparations. So they had to pay money to the Westerners plus Japan uh, for the violence committed. Then, this part is key, I would say the most important impact of the Boxer Rebellion. So, did the rebellion technically succeed? No, but I would say in the long term it did. So, this showed Westerners 
that China is not going to be able to be colonized easily. There will be significant resistance, and this is what ultimately prevents at least Western Europeans from colonizing China. Eventually, Japan will do that on the eastern coast, uh, but this in the short term does uh, resist full-on colonization. All right. So that's it for this section. I wanted to keep this uh, lecture set to just new imperialism. Again, uh, this is super important stuff from a world history standpoint and a European history standpoint. So keep this one chambered in your historical arsenal. Thanks for listening. Have a good day.